But at some point, we've got to look at it and put, you know, purpose over profits and and people over profits and say, well, what is the legacy that I'm building? Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Barely. How do I serve the tribe? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? Most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. YouTube, what's going on? Nicholas Barely here. Welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Show. I have a massive interview for you guys today, especially if you're a faith-based entrepreneur. This can be something that you're absolutely going to love. The one thing I want to say right off the bat, though, is that you're going to want to hit that subscribe button if you have not subscribed yet and ring that little bell so that you can get notifications when episodes like this drop. It's awesome that you're here. It's even more awesome. Three days a week, we drop Q&A shows, we, dro we drop trainings, we drop interviews with the best people on the planet, 100% free for you, just like today's episode with a great friend of mine who built a business, sold it, said he failed 11 businesses along his way. So if you've ever failed before, you're going to love this, especially when you see the triumph of success where he found his purpose, his passion, his vision, and built a legacy for faith-based entrepreneurs, helping them go online, build a business with their message, and make an impact in the world. Welcome, my friend, Mr. Nick Unsworth. Mr. Nick Unsworth, welcome back to the BDB podcast, man. Dude, great to be here, man. Honored, pumped. Yeah, we're, we're both out here in a whole different state, both in Texas. You just came back from an epic mastermind with Tony Robbins, Dean Graciosi, and a bunch of other epic people. I left it at that so that I didn't like rank them in order and miss anyone. <laughs> I saw that happen the other day, actually. I'm like, they left out Nick Unsworth. Don't what? leave out my boy. You said all these names. <laughs> now it's, uh, it's why we both came from California. So I'm, I have to ask right off the bat, was the move worth it? Are you liking Texas? Are you going back to California? Oh What's my going on? Gosh. We absolutely love the great state of Texas. It is its own free country out here. And um, yeah, we absolutely love it. I mean, it was um, a decision that, you know, we started thinking about it, um, you know, really was about our kids and about just like, you know, where, where would we live anywhere in the entire world is how we looked at it. We're like we can live anywhere. We can up and move and we have no strings attached anywhere. So uh, we just started researching and, you know, we, we have a mentor who's a pastor out here. We've got a school that we love and want our kids to go to. We love the values, the people. And um, it took one trip, man. And I know it's kind of like that for you. It's like one trip. And as soon as we got here, that for me, um, not to be overly, you know, spiritual about it, but like for my wife and I, it was literally like we had a whole encounter on it and and we heard from God and it was like the time is now we had urgency and we just said, okay, like, you know, you don't have like a, a tangible moment with God all the time. Like, I mean, there's prayer, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a believer, it's like, this was something that was so clear. We had confirmation with other people. And then, so we basically beelined it. And everything worked out so fast. I mean, from you know buying this house to even selling our house in, in such a short period of time. And so we absolutely love it. We've been back to San Diego, and it's so sad to think where we spent you know almost a decade. Uh, but it's just just different season of our lives, you know. And and for us, this makes a lot of sense. And everyone's always like, "Well, was it the taxes? Was it this?" And like that wasn't the catalyst. But when we feel that you know, in a year for tax time, like, okay, that'll be pretty cool. That'll be a nice little bonus. It's like a fast action bonus. <laughs> <laughs> That's a I, I just went back to San Diego as well. And it felt like I never left, which was weird. But, and it was nice when I was in these nice areas where I was like, oh man, the cafe's open. I feel like this regularness again. And then all of a sudden, like when I get back here, I'm like, oh wow, this is the big difference. I don't think I could ever I really almost don't think that I could ever live there as my full-time residence ever again. Right now, I'm only six months in, but I went through six months of really like the worst weather that Texas ever had as well. We had the ice storm. I know that you were like dumping water in your toilets as I was and housing three people at the same time that didn't have power. I had rolling blackouts. That was insane. But real quick, before I, I want to dive into some of that stuff, but you said something that was you could live anywhere in the world. And this is a big deal to me for the people out there. Most people think that life is harder when they don't have any money. They don't have resources. They don't have time. They think that that's when life is, is harder or they take stewardship. But at the end of the day, you're, you choose the flight you get on, the house you live in, the rent that you pay, the shoes you buy, the food you buy based on the price, which means that you don't really have to think. It's just like, well, what can I afford? Whereas when you have this freedom now to be able to choose where should I live, where could I go? 
you now have to steward because you can move anywhere, which is scary because you have all the options before you and you have to choose. Tell me the process that you went through to make good decisions when it wasn't just based on can we afford it or do I have the time or is there a good job there? Yeah, the, the, those aren't the things that you're thinking about that makes decisions actually really easy. Prosperity can come at a price. You have to be a good decision maker. How did you work through that? Yeah, you know, what's, what's interesting is the decision specifically for, for Texas uh, 100% revolves around legacy. And what's interesting is as you were sharing, like you know, asking about the, this question, it made me think that um, most of the decisions that we make in our business and now in our lives revolve around the exact same word, legacy. And because so in the beginning as an entrepreneur, you're scratching and clawing. You know, I've been near bankruptcy. I've been broke. I failed at 11 businesses. I've had some just crazy ups and downs. And, um, you know, and it's not a, you know, who's got the worst, you know, horror story as an entrepreneur. I mean, I think most people can relate that it's it's tough and we go through the ringer. Um, but as you kind of come out the other side of that with by staying the course and have more resources, it's like there's I, I, I think I've um, recently had a, a very um, profound experience with Les Brown and he was just talking about, um, you know, urgency in life and talking about legacy and talking about, you know, what we're really here to do. And, um, but also to watch him and to hear him speak so powerfully and to see him in his seventies as a man who's been one of the greatest speakers but it, what's wild is like you see someone and he was talking about it, you know, like he doesn't know how much time he has left. And the more you look at folks that are in their 60s, in their 70s, they're all or not, I shouldn't say all, but some folks that I'm hanging around in different masterminds, they're doing whatever it takes to see what can they do to elongate life. And if you just take a moment and think about that, I mean, what would Steve Jobs have done for another year? Right, like what would a billion a billionaire do for another year, another month, another day of life? And so in, in the grind, it's so easy to take so many things for granted, but at some point we've got to look at it and put, you know, purpose over profits and, and people over profits and say, well, what is the legacy that I'm building? And so when I, um, part of the catalyst for moving to Texas was a dear friend, um, Steve Weatherford, he, uh, you know, cast this vision. He's just like, and he was just like, Nick, we only have one chance. There's only one legacy. And why wouldn't I put my family in the best position to win? Why wouldn't I put my family in the best position to win spiritually, financially? And he was talking about Texas and talking about our mentor, Pastor Keith Craft. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm listening. I'm like, he's so right. Like, he, yes, like that's that's everything that we're doing with our company, Life on Fire, is like, how can we, in our case, build the kingdom? We're a faith-based company for faith-based entrepreneurs. And how can we glorify God and how can we live out the mission assignment that he's given us. And what's wild about it is that decision for Texas was literally based around setting up our family for generations and putting our kids in the best position to win by the, the church they're going to go to, the school they're going to go to, the values out here in Frisco, Texas. Um, but then when if, if I think about that same framework for other decisions, it's like we're now saying no to a lot of stuff. And we hear that. As you get more successful, you have to say no to things. But it's so tempting, right? Like money is such a, um, a temptress, if you will, right? Like it's, and so, but we have been really disciplined to put our focus on like what we believe to be our purpose in our lives and our businesses and our legacy. And that is like our North star that's driving everything we're doing. And we're saying no to a ton of things, even though they look good and they look like they'd be fun and everyone else is doing it. And we're just staying the course on, you know, that mission and legacy. So that's the framework. That's the awesome, legacy man. Framework. So the purpose, the legacy, and then obviously the physical location that you're at with the church and the environment, which is interesting for us as well. When we were moving, it that was a great thing, like a, almost like a filter. You go through Zillow and stuff, and you go through all the sites that you go through, and you're like, I want this much square foot, and I want this much land, and I want two-story, and I want a pool. And all of a sudden, it breaks down like 35,000 options into 50 options yeah. that are currently available. And for us, same thing a church. So for the people listening, maybe thinking about their legacy and like what matters most to you for us, it was like, we can move to Florida. And I'm like, Oh, it'd be cool to have a six spot on the beach, right? You could be right on the water for nothing compared to California. And it's like, but there is no church there. And so even when I get tempted by, Oh, a six spot in with a boat on the back of the dock, I'm like, but that 
doesn't have the core thing that I care about most, which is having the church right here that we can be a part of and plant our roots and have kids that Kingston can hang out with and moms that Amanda can hang out with that are like-minded in the most important way, along with like-minded and things that are more uh, common interests, right? Like we both love business, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, being both faith-based is more important to us than both being in business. That's just the second thing that's awesome. Yeah. It, it's just so so interesting about uh keeping up with the joneses you know so it was so tempting to you know coming out here i mean the cost of housing is a fraction of what it was in san diego and we're having the best year two years of our lives of our careers of for me i'm about to be 40 like of my entire i've been an entrepreneur since 18 years old and it's like the the best we've ever done the the everything's going so great and it's like, well, why don't you go get this like stupid mansion? Like this crate, you know? And it's like, we, uh, we got a beautiful house. It's way bigger. It's like 2000 square feet bigger than the one we had in San Diego, but it's, it was still less. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is like, you know, we got rid of Megan's Mercedes SUV and we got a GMC. Like it's, I, I, I feel like there's such a pressure to, you know, compete with everybody on that. And it's, and it's, so I find myself like just being totally transparent. Like I find myself like, Oh, you know, um, I would love to just go get the car, but it's like, it, it it's such a, uh, it's a trophy to kind of showcase success and things like that. Um, and I like nice things, nice things. I think most people do, but we have like chosen to be super disciplined with those things. And like my car is like an 08 BMW I got for 20 grand. It's an M3. So it's sick. Like I love it. I like haul with it, you know, but, um, but we're finding a lot of, uh, you know, just joy in like being a really good steward and like having our giving increase and having, um, you know, surplus to invest and do different things. And I feel like I have made a lot of reckless decisions throughout all the years. Um, but that to kind of bring it to that place of being a good steward is, is, uh, is really cool. I think it's like creates freedom, which is cool. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because people take things like Steve Jobs and the clothes that he wore, and they're like, "Well, why do I ever need to buy a nice pair of clothes? Like that guy's a multi-billionaire and whatever, and he didn't." I'm like, "Ah, oh, like it's not that there's different seasons, different people, and even for me, like it's interesting because if you're already here, you maybe someone will take it. Oh, this is just another guy that's like trying to downsize his cars and stuff so that he could like be." just not have the nice thing. Maybe he doesn't care about nice things. I care about nice things, whatever it is. But even for me, I had my sick truck that I had earned through a goal that I had. I bought my truck for two years. That I sold my nice truck, truck when I moved here. And Fits right in in Texas. <laughs> no, I sold it before. Oh, I moved you sold here, it? Right before. Yeah, because oh, I was like, I was going to have to ship it there and I had it for two years already. And I looked up and I was like, wasn't going to lose any money on the truck. So I thought I could literally sell the truck and I literally paid less than $300 a month to drive my truck for the years. And I, I bought my truck outright, but if you were to break it down yeah. into payments, what I lost less than 300 bucks, I go, I couldn't have even leased a Honda Civic for that. Right? Like that's sick. Yet when we moved out here, I, we weren't driving. And so right now for the first like three or four years of marriage, we've had one car and then we've had two cars in between. And literally still, I have not bought another car. We, we have just one car. And Dude, if you show up with a horse, bro, and a big Texas belt buckle and some cowboy yeah. boots. <laughs> but say, similar thing is all I'm saying is that, you know, people think, oh, maybe that means that something bad's going on. Or maybe that means that they're just like having this weird mental thing where they're like, oh, I don't want the nice things. I just want to go for these things. And, and I, you know, I listen to stuff like this and it's like different seasons. Like you may go out there and buy a Lamborghini. Probably not, but maybe. But at the end of the day, like the core principles of what you're talking about, you'll never know. Like you're enjoying the GMC and that's what's giving you life. And having the sick Mercedes SUV isn't something that you really care about right now. And I think it's cool for other people to kind of think about what do they care about? Because yeah. there's been times where I would have cared a lot about having my truck or an R8. Oh man, how sick would it be to go to the car shows and have the R8? And I'm like, I just don't really care. Like I literally didn't care about my truck anymore. I was like, I, I'm literally not selling it because I just don't want people to think like, why is he selling his truck? But I was like, I don't, I got all my joy out of it. I don't really care anymore. Like, I don't want to have it here. I don't even want to ship it. I want to park it in my driveway. I want it. And it was a very interesting process. So I appreciate you shedding light on those different things. I, before I go to the, to the purpose-based business stuff that you talked about, you did kind of hit on, you went from, from 
the keeping up with the Joneses, or the, it's a desire sometimes for people to keep up with the Joneses. You've had nice BMW SUVs, I think Mercedes Viper SUVs. Suite. I think I've, <laughs> I've seen quite a few, and and it is tempting to have the things. And there's nothing wrong with having the things. It's all about why do I have the things? Is it something that you really enjoy? Yeah. And so touch on that a little bit. How you're navigating that the balance between keeping up with the Joneses, being a successful entrepreneur and also showing who you are, right? I just got a new landscaper because I told my landscaper, I said, listen, my house is not representing who I am. I want this to be clean and taken care of. And right now it doesn't look that way. I want to represent who I am. And, and for us representing the kingdom well as well, excellence and, and taking care of our stuff. How do you navigate all those different trespasses of not trying to keep up with the Joneses while keeping excellence, while being who you are and the desires that you have on your heart and not just skipping out on them. How do you navigate that? Yeah. So the thing that we're uh, just hyper-focused on is um, developing financial, like total financial freedom. And that for us and our family is a higher priority. So it's almost like it's just a new lens. It's just a, and I don't know if it's part age because now, you know, about to be 40. So now you start thinking about retirement, that kind of stuff. But it's also maybe, um, I don't know who you're surrounding yourself with that kind of stuff. But, but basically our heart on it is we want to sprint towards complete and true financial freedom to where cash flow from investments exceeds our entire life so that we mm -hmm. hit you know, never need to work moment. Now I love what I do. Like I'll be that dude working when he's 90. Like I'll be, I'll be doing like a zoom flipping webinar, 3000 people, you know, like I love it, man. I, it lights me up. This is my, you know, this is as Tony Robbins talks about, like, this is my mission business. This is not something I'd ever sell. Um, but every decision is like, you know, you know, even with my car, like, I mean, shoot, we went in, um, we went and checked out this track in Texas uh, and you get to rip around exotic cars on the track and we're bringing a bunch of clients out there. So have a whole fun track day and we drove the R8 and it was like, my wife always talks about how much she loves the R8 and I love the flipping R8 and that thing hauled and it was so fun. And I definitely had that fantasy for a moment of like, we could totally do this. Like, let's, let's go get it. And then it was like, but the, doing that means that's a hundred, 180 grand of money. That's not being put into like a commercial real estate multifamily deal. That's going to yield 20% on the money cash on cash. That's going to create cash flow. That, that's then going to be used to have create financial freedom. And it, the thing is, it's not just about freedom for us is we're sprinting towards that. And the business application and why this I think is a cool message for everybody is that when you put the focus on like lowering expenses, higher net margin business, um, we're taking ground in our our industry of business coaching for us for faith based entrepreneurs. But the whole thing is that we're doing things that our competitors can't, and part of it is because we don't need the money as much. Meaning, our nine hundred ninety seven dollar program comes with two one on one sixty minute strategy sessions plus three emergency calls. That's two and a half hours of of one-on-one -on -one coaching that is not a sales call. Some people that are cheesy, you know, they'll have a sales team and call it like a coaching call. I hate that. It drives me nuts. But like we are able to basically move the line and uh and and do more for our clients and other companies. And that's at like the lower ticket, all the way up to the higher ticket. And so we want to be that blessing in the world, like even our free challenges. If anyone talks about challenges, right? That's a big thing. It's a big buzz. Well, we've been doing them for a while. We've done them paid. We've done them for free. Well, what most people will see in the industry is everyone does these big old launches, right? Well, all these challenges is, hey, it's free. Come join the XYZ Guru Challenge. And then the first thing that you see is an upsell for 97 bucks, 197 bucks, right? So how does that make people feel? I don't know about you, but if I'm like, ooh, you know, free challenge that's going to help me do this, this, and this. And then within five seconds, not even within a, a second of opting in, it's like, well, you're going to get the free base version. You're going to get the Facebook group, but you're not going to be here where all the cool people are hanging out and you're going to be on Zoom. And I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Every single human being in that challenge that's not in the VIP, they're going to feel FOMO. They're going to feel like they're missing out. Now, obviously that's good for conversions. That's good for making money. But you know what? For us, the fact that we don't need to do that because the reason is cash flow. People like, and people tell me we're crazy all the time. They say, but Nick, 
if you run your ads for your challenge, you're putting all that money at risk. And when are you going to get it back? And I'm like, well, I'm not worried about it. We're getting it back in 30 days. But for them, they put it out and they get it back almost immediately from the upsells. My point of that is that by making decisions with legacy in mind, our brand long-term value is we'll always be known as the good guys, you know, like we'll be known as people that have truly genuinely care for people. Um, as we roll more content out, you know, it's like, we're not looking to just make money. We're looking to make impact. We're looking to build a legacy. And so it's almost like all of those decisions, you know, start to change where it's like, gosh, well, we could do this, but imagine having that much money, how many people we could sponsor into our, our program or the prizes we could make bigger. So it's just kind of like shifting of the heart to think about how much all of that could be beneficial for other people and also making your stuff the best in the industry. And you can stand out by doing things your competitors don't or can't by being a good steward, you know, in your own life, your personal life, that kind of thing. That is cool to have it tied to this bigger thing, right? It's not just, Oh, we're just buying these things or not buying these things because of X, Y, Z reason. It's like, no, this is where we're going as a family, that whole legacy piece you're talking about. And you're saying, no, for example, my truck, we're looking at buying 10 acres, just 30 minutes north of us. Nice. We're going to build a retreat facility and all these different things. And the, the down payment on a piece of land like that, it's like literally choosing what I want this vehicle that literally does nothing besides maybe quantifying. I get to go race it on the track and network and whatever, or I can invest in this piece of property that's actually going to do something. I never thought about that before. That's why I have a bunch of pairs of $1,300 shoes up in my freaking uh, thing that just don't matter. And I'm like, I could have done so many things with that money that would have been so much more impactful mm. that also like a lot of people in our space said is it allows you to buy those things. They, they said, don't use your money to buy these stupid things that are depreciating assets, but use the assets to then buy the things that you yeah. want inside of your life. And it sounds like you're setting it up that way, which I think is really, really cool. You said some other epic stuff in there that I'm going to go back. People should go back and listen to what you just said again. There's like three key points in there that I can literally break apart. We do a whole episode on it. So one of the big things that you've done is that Life on Fire looks pretty dramatically different in the clientele and maybe some of the teaching that you taught before. And though it says Life on Fire and you're the same people and you talk about similar topics, it's changed a lot, a huge amount. And people may look at that and go, well, that's awesome. Look how successful it's been. You, you're tripling your business over this year. That's amazing. I wish it was like that for me, but you don't know that going into it. So tell me the transition and how other people can get into something that's more purposeful, more legacy, but also talk about some of the fears because it could have failed and you could have looked like a total loser and like, look yeah. like, you know, God's not on your side. Ha ha jokes on you. Cause I've been there. I was the health guy. And then I was a health guy for men. And then I transitioned. And each one of those was the scariest thing on the planet because what if I failed? And I had to go back and be the guy that I used to be because that's what worked. You had to make this massive transition that's more purposeful, legacy filled, and you succeeded. Walk me through the process of how that was and some of the things you had to overcome to do it. Yeah, this is a, a great question because it's it's there's so many lessons in there for everyone to, to grab onto. And um so basically life on fire, uh, for coming up on 10 years, um, uh, we've been doing, you know, just teaching people how to get online, teaching people how to clarify their message and start their own business online. So it could be your own show, your own podcast, YouTube channel, virtual summits, and, and have heavy emphasis on coaching and we certify people. So that's what we've been doing. That's been, you know, the, the company, the business now along the way, you know, 2014 early, I meet my wife, my life completely changes. Uh, 2013 at the end of the year, I have this moment, got encounter with God and um, I grew up Catholic. I always believed in God, but I was always far from God. I didn't like the religious stuff and all that. Became a born again Christian and just realized like, wow, like this is, I'm going to surrender my life to God. Then I meet my wife. She's like totally into her faith. And long story short is like, we went down that path and, and we're being kind of groomed as campus pastors and we ran a service. So that became such a huge part of our life and still is. So what was interesting is that as early as 2014, we would do what we're doing in the marketplace, throw these big in-person events, have these really cool speakers come in, walk on broken glass. Remember that? Do you ever do the, I think you were there broken glass I and the through the board and all that. 
A hundred percent. Yeah. So like it was, you know, really cool stuff that we were doing. And then um, I had a vision to share my faith and just share my testimony. Cause sometimes people look at it and they're like, well, Nick, why, how did you get all crazy into your faith? Like what happened? And so I just share the story and it's just, when you hear somebody talk about a couple of miracles that happened to them, it's just unbelievable. Like it's hard even for our minds to comprehend. And so I just share like the love that God has for us and, and like what happened in my life. And I just say, Hey, if you want to do that too, he's free. <laughs> you know, you've heard from me and my mentors and this mentor is free, right? So we do these, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, they're called altar calls. And so we would have, you know, 10, 15, 20% of the room, like dedicate their life to God. And like, and it was just that, that's a, that became the purpose behind the purpose with life on fire. And so Weatherford would call it, he would joke around. I don't like this phrase, but he would joke around and say, well, that's kind of like, so you're doing the sneaky Jesus. Like we would have these cool events and we would respect everybody and say, Hey, the event's over. But if you want to stay, I'm going to share something about faith. You don't have to. And, and then we would rent a bus and we'd bus everyone to church and like, and it was cool. We have thousands of people dedicate their lives to God and a crazy cool scenario. But what happened is after a couple years of that, I had a, a full vision from God about um, making the whole company about faith-based entrepreneurs. And instead of it being kind of like a, you know, after someone's in and at the event and like a, a bonus session, right? At the end of an event about putting him first, putting him first. We put him first in our marriage, we put him first in, in all things, but put him first in the business. And dude, I got to tell you that I sat on that vision for three years. And here's what happened as we got closer. So dude, about three years ago, right when I first got the vision, right? So when I first got the vision, maybe some of you can relate to this, right? You, you catch a vision, you catch an idea, you're excited. Well, I was excited about it. I started talking about it and I'm like, we're going to go build this huge platform. We're going to share God stories and miracles and talk about faith and life fire is going to go more faith. Well, dude, I start talking about it and guess what happens? We lose our entire flipping team. I lose my coaching director. I lose our trainers. I lose our coaches. I lose the entire company. I mean, we're talking out of 15 people. I lost, I don't, uh, but yeah, 10 of them, 10 people out of 15. And, and of the five remaining was two virtual assistants in the Philippines, Ruthie, God bless her in Connecticut and Megan and I, everyone else. And the reason they left is because our values were going faith and they didn't identify either atheist or wow. homosexual or what have you. And they, they thought that it was going to be a problem. Now they knew my heart. I, I didn't care if someone was homosexual, gay. I didn't care if someone did Reiki. I didn't, it didn't matter to me, but over time it became more clear <laughs> that like we kind of needed to have a team all on the same page. Right. And so um, that happened and dude, it wiped us out, man. And we're talking 2018. I mean, our company flipped upside down. Um, cause they, they, they didn't just leave. They actually pulled clients with them and, and did damage. And so we ended up a few, like, imagine that a few hundred thousand dollars in debt, like insane. Right. I mean, I had this great ramp up in 2013 and then like, it was, it was nuts. So, so, so this yeah. was when you first started making this transition. You had the vision. You started talking about it a little bit, kind of setting the tone and whatever. And right away, you were like, "It was like a met with disaster." A to the face. Bam. Did you have this feeling like you kind of wanted to almost run back to stuff that worked? Like maybe I should start running Facebook ads, like my first company. <laughs> like, crazy. Was thing. there any of that, or what was it like? Is like so, and we didn't even go full faith or anything. That was the that was the the the, the nutty part. Is I only just <laughs> talked about going. <laughs> I didn't even, we didn't even make the transition. So what happened was basically like when that happened, it became a scramble of, you know, scratching and clawing to get the company back on track and like get revenues back up. And, and, but it was it. So in every time that there's something crazy that happens in business for whatever reason, maybe this is my superpower is like getting bludgeoned and then finding a way to find the silver lining is like, you know, my whole life story is like, I've, I've had these crazy things that happen, but I always find like, what's the blessing in it, right? And so we actually prayed and asked God, like, what do we do here? Give us a sign. Well, the sign was everybody left. That was pretty obvious because um, we asked like, what do we do on the situation? So they left, but it also changed our entire strategy. I was trying to go like 
Tony Robbins mode with like, I was developing content and events and hiring trainers and other people became the connection point with the clients, not Megan and I. And so they were more close with our trainers and coaches than us. So I was being an owner and I was scaling a, a real business and my goal was to bring it our uh, events across the globe. And so anyway, that reset everything to realize like, you know what, that really where we're going with this is um, a little bit more of a Megan and I as like a personality kind of brand, um, you know, not big, huge scale like that. So it reset like the model, but that, but that also set us back in time. And yeah, that brought up a lot of like fears of like, well, maybe this isn't a good idea, but I, as much as that fear came in, I literally looked at it and said, if it's this crazy, like if there's this much um, darkness around us going this direction, like, you know, if we think about like, if there's this much, like the enemy doesn't want us to do this, like, that's why we're freaking doing it, you know? And then it took, it just took time to get the company back on track. Long story short is COVID hits. The world is flipped upside down. If we all think back to like that month of March, right? When it first hit and we talk, I'm talking about the panic. I'm talking about the shelves without toilet paper. Like there's memes later, but like when we, that first week or two, three weeks, four weeks, I was on mastermind calls with heavy hitters and everyone was like, Hey, do you have like a bug out plan? Like you got bags packed? Like, you know, if, if the world gets crazy, you know what I mean? Like remember back to that. So in that moment, that's when we said, you know what, we are going to shift our challenge model, which we've been doing for a long time. Instead of it being paid, we're going to make it free. And we're literally going to be generous and we're going to train people through this nightmare. So all these companies that are suffering and closed and blah, blah, blah. I mean, by April, actually, no, we launched it in March. Like we just moved so fast and we did the launch your expertise online challenge to just help as many people all over the country and world as we could to get online. And that's our superpower, getting online. So like we did it for free and we were generous and then we still shared, hey, here's how you can work with us. Long story short is it was explosive. It was amazing. And and everyone, like people were so grateful whether they bought or not. And from that, it was like, well, if we're ripping Band-Aids off and we're taking risks during COVID, then why don't we just have the freaking guts, the faith balls, if you will, <laughs> To go do the thing that I literally knew and had certainty of what God showed me in a vision. And it was like, we're just going to do it. So in August, we did our first challenge. Now this Life on Fire challenge we've been doing since 2015. But for the very first time, we said it's this is for faith-based entrepreneurs. And um, now the risk on that was, well, we have a ton of clients. We're you know multiple seven-figure business. Like, are we going to piss off everybody else? And we were just honest with them and just said, Hey, this is something we're really passionate about. We'll respect you and all the fulfillment that we're doing where we're not going to be like, you know, praying and like pushing anything on you. Like, so we'll respect everybody where they're at, but this is something we're really passionate about and something that I know God showed me to do. And I'm finally stepping into it. So basically when we did that, here's what happened. This is the classic marketing case of when you're so broad, when you try and be friends with everybody you end up, you know, having a very numbed message. And so as soon as it started off and we're talking Facebook videos of, you know, Hey, if you're a faith-based entrepreneur, you know, or calling all faith-based entrepreneurs, it just, it was like, think of it like a dog whistle. Like for some people, it was an immediate skip an immediate, Oh, get out of here. Oh, uh, so like you, you know, the classic repel, like your marketing repels a lot of people, but for all the people that are entrepreneurs and do have faith, it was like, I've been praying for you, or I've been waiting my whole life for you. And, and it was just unbelievable. So we went from, we used to do challenges with 500 people, you know, all of a sudden we're putting up a challenge with 11,000 people in it. We did our last one with over 20,000 people in it. We're going to do another one, you know, called business on fire challenge. That one, you know, we're going to just double the budget. So we should have 40,000 people on it. We're talking filling flipping stadiums and just blessing everybody with this awesome content. And so but here's the other thing. So the message, the, the, the takeaway is not just uh, this is the refining of your target market or the refining of your message. The, the other takeaway is that 
when you fully step into who you are authentically are and like that assignment and purpose, there's this other X factor shift, right? Like the 10 X or hundred X. Like it's, it's um to see my wife step into the role with me and hop on a zoom with almost 4,000 people live and open it up in prayer and stand there. And we had been doing 20 hours a week serving at our church for, I don't know, six, seven years. And to just be just praying and prophesying over people and just, and just the whole atmosphere. So what people are now watching is they're watching Megan and I like little kids. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're like, we're, it's like the childlike faith, like childlike enthusiasm for our business that we haven't had, you know, and, and we're just, we're literally doing what we're meant to do and people can see that. And so our whole company's life on fire. So they're just like, wow, they're, they're on fire and it's causing other people to want to live their lives on fire. And then the mission, the mission is, and this is crazy, dude, for almost all of my entrepreneurial career, literally, I've always dreamed of having something that was the purpose behind the business. Something that like, for example, pencils of promise. Well, Adam Braun cared about that nonprofit because of his story. And I always was like, gosh, like I'm passionate about giving them, like, I want to have a purpose. There's no movement. You can't just call it a movement. Like what's a real movement. And, and I never had anything and I've lost parent or uh, grandparents to Alzheimer's, but that just didn't really resonate that that was my thing, you know, or I just was always searching for that give back component, but nothing, I felt like I was always crowbarring it in and it was never like truly like the thing. Right. And all of a sudden it became clear, like what we're really doing is we're helping people launch their message. We're helping other believers, other faith-based entrepreneurs step into their kingdom assignment. And ultimately not to get too far down the, the spiritual path, but like it's the great commission. I mean, God is calling us to evangelize him and to share the good news, but here's the key, to not do it in a weird way, to not be the dude in Vegas with the bell saying, hey, you're going to hell, to do it in a way that's cool and relatable and fun and empowering and inspiring without the religiousness, without the you know conviction and all the, all the yuck that comes with church that, that mo- I grew up hating, you know? So it's like, it's such a breath of fresh air to be able to be excited about God and share the goodness and be inviting to people. So, dude, now we have a flipping army, dude. We've got clients doing summits and doing uh, clubhouse channel or clubs and rooms and all this stuff. And it's like, dude, now this feels like an actual movement of, of what we used to call our event, Ignite Your Movement back in the day. So, and it's just that purpose. And so marketing better, how we show up, being able to be us. Like I, people always said like at events, like, oh yeah, Nick, you're an authentic guy. Okay, cool. But you know what? There was another level for me and that's being able to like be who I am unashamed, unapologetic and being able to pray for people, things like that. And so dude, it's been unbelievable. So it's catching so me. Up cool. really even, the, even the authentic part is, is really cool because if let's say your business model, if someone else were to pick it up and they weren't a Christian, but they called it, I'm going to copy Nick. I'm going to call it faith based oh, business. We're going to do it. They wouldn't have that passion, that excitement that you have, that conviction, that authenticity and in the last business or the last style it was, there's was probably that little shift as well, where maybe there was someone out there that was a bit more passionate business coach because they knew they were living like exactly what they're supposed to do. But you were like, I know that I'm supposed to teach these guys that are in, or people that are faith-based. I say guys so much because I talk to guys all day, but people, men and women that are faith-based, build this business, get their message out there, et cetera. And when you stepped into that, I'm assuming that gave you that extra level of enthusiasm, excitement oh that- really yeah. does make a difference. It's not just viable business. Yeah. Like if you were to go start a Facebook ad agency again, if someone's pumped about that, they're probably going to beat you in that business. If you're like, I'm just doing it for the money, but you found that like great. I, I like how Russell actually talks about, it. he says opportunity and uh, skill set. Like a le- they always talk about like someone has a level 10 uh, skill set with level one opportunity. Mm. And they just, it doesn't really work. They like work so hard. They're really good at what they do. And that's what he felt he had. He had a good skill set. He could sell things, but like he didn't really ever have a great product. And then he created a product that was actually needed and it was a good opportunity. And then the skill set aligned. So you have like the passion, the dream, but also a foundation of a business that really works. And do you feel that that's also what you're helping a lot of these other Christians do is 
they may be passionate about what they do. They want to have a great business. They may even have great skill sets. But how do you also help them find an opportunity that actually is viable, that has a market cap that people actually invest money in? Because you find sometimes people are in businesses that just no one really wants it. Do you, how do you help them decipher that along with that passion and faith-based side of the business? Yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting because um, I would say so many Christians, um, you know, it's like they might be inspired, they're following Jesus, they're doing all these different things. But like in the marketplace, there's a lot of stinking thinking. I mean, there's a lot of like, we can't, you know, that money's bad and all these different things. And so, and I do feel that they fall for like scams more than anyone. Oh, like for sure, they want to be blessed. Sure. So they want the easy way to make money. So oh my not gosh. everyone, but this, what I felt is the like lottery praying for the lottery numbers, hoping that they get some random check in the mail from a settlement or something random. Not, a, not a lot of co co laboring as like the Bible would talk about, like actually tilling yeah, the land I mean, and planting the and, seeds. And so it's, it's like, um, I th I feel like what's what's unique is that we have built a company that equips people to go build their brands online and go build their companies online, and and so that's a unique skill set to pair with the faith based community, um, you know, because there's just not many churches that like dive into the entrepreneurial side of things, and so um, it's a really good pairing. I think that you know it's it's kind of real talk, like it's you know that, you know, what's a good opportunity, what, what are bad opportunities and helping people just cut through the noise of, you know, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to build something significant, let's start with what is the message and, and, you know, yeah. what is your purpose? What is your message? And, and where do you want to go? Cool. And then we got to put the right business model behind them because there's so many bad ones. And, you know, I've seen so many personally and I've coached so many people. So I, I I'm able to help them navigate, um, but we kind of boil it down to, you know, most people are building more, uh, you know, either done for you, like different agency, different models, helping people that way, or, you know, content, personal brand, and, you know, go in that direction, coaching a lot of, a lot of coaches. Well, I think it's awesome to do what you're doing. We were both, you've been in this industry longer than, than I have. Even when I entered this industry, 2012, 2013, 2014, generally there wasn't people that had this, these ideals or beliefs or foundations that were also great at business. Like you couldn't just go to your church and be like, who's building a business here? <laughs> and then have a mentor. You usually had to learn from people that you're like, man, like he's cheating on his wife or she's doing this or whatever. And you're like, but they know business. So I have to learn from it. So I think it's really cool for the people out there that maybe they're even thinking about it, but also the Christians out there. It's like, this is a place where you can get real great business strategies from people that are actually doing them yeah. as well as having a foundation of a community that have same moral beliefs that rub off on you as well and help you become that better person, help you reach your full potential. Uh, we, there's a quote from Bethel that says some things are better caught than taught. And it's just like when you're around people that are great at business, but also bad in other areas, it rubs off on you, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And so when you're around people that are building you up in all these areas, I think it's really amazing. And the last thing that I'll say is how do you deal? You have to have, I get targeted on Facebook all the time from like these people, like 30,000 people watching and all of them are like the mass profits of the world. And they're telling everyone what's going on in the world. And I'm like, they might, and they might all be legit. So like I might be the dummy here, but you have to have people jumping into some of your challenges, going live, taking over the reins, telling them that God tell, told them to do this. You got to tell me how you deal with this. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's been a little, a learning curve. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, and shoot, I mean, and, and there's also some things that really sting. Like when, we, when you run ads, um, you know, you're putting yourself out there. So, and it's gotten nastier over the years when we ran ads in 2010, it's very different than now. Um, people are now suspicious. There's so many scammers. Um, it is sad that most people's knee jerk reaction is to tear people down. And so ads and comment has, has gotten crazy. It's a total bummer to have people look at something and, and even though it's totally free, there's no money exchange. Like, and we coach for two weeks. It's like some people, you know, oh, you're a false prophet or like making money off of God. And as much as that hurts and I want to defend it, it's one of these things where um, anyone that knows us and you can be in the challenge for flip, flipping five minutes 
it's so obvious with what we give, with what we do, with what we tie, all the things that are just who we are as people. Like it, we just let our actions speak louder. So we've kind of made peace with it. Um, but what's interesting is that when you're on the inside and you have like, I mean, there's 23,000 people in like our free Facebook group, um, you know, managing that's a little bit, a little bit different. And, um, and we keep doing challenges and filling that group. So that group is going to keep growing, which is a really good strategy. A lot of times people will do a campaign or a challenge or something, and then it, they pop the group up and you take it down. You pop it up. We used to do that too, but I encourage you build the asset, build your community. And one little thing, I don't share this often, usually just for clients, make it a, pri- a public group because a public group can originate content and share outside the group. So when we go live, and you got a hundred people sharing that flipping thing all over. I mean, it's nuts. So everyone does private groups, but so anyway, that's big, but it's been um, interesting where we've had to carve out our guidelines so that, uh, cause, cause on Sunday, everyone wants to stream church, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, right? Like we're faith based, but like, we don't want 300 watch parties for, you know what I mean? It just gets, it's, there's no organization. So we've had to say like, Hey, you know, we love that. We want you to go to your church, plug in and like, until we do our own services or something. But, um, but we, you know, have to just put that in the guidelines. We have to, um, even, and this was a tough one. This was really, really brutal. Um, prayer requests. So you get, I mean, just imagine when people, even if they're far from God, they ask for something in prayer when they kind of need it. Right. So it's like, Oh my gosh, I just got diagnosed with cancer. Like I need prayer requests and blah, blah, blah. Or, or usually it's about someone else. It's a family member. Um, and those are moments that's our opportunity to rise up and to do something about it and pray and believe and, and, and see a miracle happen. So it's important. So it just was getting a little heavy. Right. And when, and when one thing is about cancer, the next person's a car accident, like it just, it's a heaviness that kind of fell on the group. So we made the decision And this is what a church does. And this is what Megan and I got trained on for years is all those prayer requests. We we need an atmosphere of faith in that group. And this is how we explain it. We said, listen, we need an atmosphere of faith in this group, faith over fear. And when we see these the heaviness and it's kind of pulling everyone down. Now, it's not to diminish the fact that someone just got cancer and we want to do something about it. We're just going to put it in a proper channel. We're going to organize it. So we have a whole prayer request and praise reports function now. So everyone knows where to put prayer requests. Those prayer requests, we have people praying for them. At some point, we're going to hire someone literally just to like pray for them. And, um, but now they're in a a spot. We're still giving them the love that they deserve. And we're still believing and praying for those, you know, but it's just now we want the group to be in in an atmosphere of of faith. And the other thing is we're trying to teach people that, you know, Jesus didn't pray the problem. So if we come in and we're like, oh my gosh, like everything sucks and I'm in debt and blah, blah, blah. Like, you're, you're sliming everybody around you with your language and you're ruining yourself with what you speak over yourself. And so we're just trying to ed, you know educate people on the right way to put it out there and how to communicate. But yeah, we had to create like a channel like that. Um, just today this happened. We have someone wants to tithe and we're like, <laughs> we're not a church. <laughs> Bring it to your church. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's like we're we're not a church and that's a very important thing because we can operate in a different way and we, we don't have any stigma We're we're a company, um, which is very important, but it's fascinating to us that we're operating in a lot of ways. Like these are our people and like a, a flock. So in a way it's like all that training that we had and all the serving, you know, is, is, is good, but it's nice that we're not crossing that line. Like we are, you know, encouraging them to go to plug in and be planted in their church, tied to their church, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's so cool. And what, what I'm getting from it, there's a quote from Chris Valton, I believe, which is culture is not what you create. It's what you tolerate. You could say something, but if you don't enforce it, then that's the new culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's tough as a leader to make hard decisions. And so for the people out there, one of the things I got from it is it's easy to be like, oh, well, it's not, you know, how, how rude is it going to be for us to tell everyone, hey, you can't post your prayer requests anymore. Or you can't stream your church service because people get ticked off from that. There's a chance that it could cause strife. People, oh, wow, you guys want to. What are kind of Christian organization is this? <laughs> uh, totally. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you not only came up with a solution, but you weren't afraid to set boundaries inside of the community and you weren't afraid to tackle them when they came up. I'm sure you thought you had it figured out when they first joined and you had 
20,000 people come in and then all of a sudden people are per request this, bashing that. And you're like, oh man, we need to create boundaries around this. And you weren't afraid to do it, which is what leaders do. And you won't tolerate anything different for the goodness of the group and the greater good of the group, even if it may help 10,000 and hurt five, you know, or hurts yeah. five people's feelings to help tens of thousands of people, which I think is a really great leadership tip for people out there. I know for me, one of my first programs I ever sold, I didn't say that anyone could call me, but the first guy that joined called me every single day. And so at <laughs> first you just think, oh, well, you just spent all this money. So you pick up the first call, you're, you're screwed after that. And I had to then set better boundaries or continue being upset. And it was difficult, yeah. but we learned those things. And, and you're just an example of, again, of a great leader who set the boundary, not for this advantage for the people it creates a better environment there's a reason behind it so dude i appreciate it. i could keep going forever but i appreciate your time here for the people that are listening how can they get involved with a challenge that'd be really cool or where's the place that yeah. they can connect with you as well yeah 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 so we have a uh, business on fire challenge.com cool. and so we have a challenge coming up and we always have a challenge coming up and they're free they're meant to be just a massive over deliver so business on fire challenge and then um yeah, Instagram is just at Nick Unsworth 51, Clubhouse at Nick Unsworth. Um, but yeah, I uh, so enjoyed this conversation, man, and appreciate all that you're doing and pumped to get out to Austin to hang, get, go have some barbecue. And then for all of you oh, yeah. listening or watching, I'd love to connect and uh, I hope you got some takeaways out of this and I'd love to serve you on a challenge. Awesome, man. Thanks so much again. All right. Thanks, brother.